How you doing there? Just a quickie before we start. On the Apple podcast, why don't you double click on David McWilliams Plus? It's right there when you open the podcast. You get ad free, you unlock early access. Just double click and away you go. David McWilliams Plus, you get this pure and simple. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. How are you doing there? It is podcast time. We have a lot to get through on this podcast because this is one of those weeks there's so much going on, so much going on. Lots going on in Ireland, lots going on in the UK, and we have a special piece looking at global inequality. So we're kind of packed, John. We have a packed session today. Good, 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 good. I like that. I'll just give you a sense of what we're going to do. We're going to first go to London. I'm going to talk to one of the best young economic journalists out there, a guy called John Byrne Murdoch, who last week in the Financial Times published a very interesting piece full of data about inequality between countries, i.e. between country to country, but also internally between rich and poor. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to update that for the Irish data to see how Ireland is doing. Then we're going to talk about the UK budget announced the other day, which was class is a mini budget, but in actual fact, it is an extraordinary lurch in policy, really propelling the UK off into some different orbit that I think is going to end quite badly for them. And then finally, we're going to have a quick look at the Irish budget. Largely speaking, I think it'll be an exercise in stability. So I think, John, we go straight to London. Yes. Talk to John Byrne Murdoch, and then we come back here. So let's go straight to London. Now I have a very, very interesting journalist, economic commentator, data man, more than anything else, on the line, John Byrne Murdoch of the FT. You probably came across, John, I certainly did first time during the pandemic, because during the pandemic, all of us were searching for data. What's going on? What's the story? Give me the ratios, all that sort of stuff. And John at the FT managed to create an entire database, or at least read an entire database and show an entire database graphically of what was going on in the pandemic. And it's always this case that people love to see charts and graphs and figures. It gives us a sense of the way the world works. And the other day, John wrote a piece for the FT looking at relative income, disposable income, in a variety of countries. And the point was to make the point that in the Anglosphere countries, let's say the UK and the US, the very rich are very, very rich indeed, and the very poor are actually very poor indeed. And the gap between rich and poor is huge. And then I saw this on Twitter, and I just tweeted John. I said, John, give us a a look at the Irish data, which he then did. And we're going to talk about the Irish data in a minute because it is quite, quite interesting. In fact, it tells a story about the economy that I probably told in that book of mine, The Renaissance Nation, a couple of years ago, of a society doing probably better than many people think. But we have John on the line from London, and let's talk about the first uh, piece of data between the US and the UK, again, for our non-Irish listeners. John, how are you? I'm good, thanks, David. Yeah, long time listener, first time caller, so great to be here. Well, that's great, that's great. Well, listen, uh, you know, the, the whole thing about these podcasts, it's, it's a bit like what you're doing yourself, is the way that, the way that people communicate economics has just changed completely. Since I was young, you know, when I was young, it was very much academic and you went, you did in college and, you know, you went to an institute. Now, you know, what you're doing using graphs and data and showing it online and using Twitter and I suppose to a degree what we're doing here is basically the democratization of what used to be a really elitist subject, really elitist. Now, I found your piece on Saturday fascinating. Explain to me and explain to the listeners what you were doing, what you were trying to do and what the outcome was. Sure. So I guess if, if we start with what the, the moving parts of this piece are, um, we you mentioned there the, the, the metric we're interested in is disposable household income. So this is the amount of money that a household is able to spend every week, every month, every year. So after things like taxes, after any benefits, uh, social security payments as well. So it's, it's essentially a, a proxy for there's the standard of living that a country, uh, that a household can enjoy. Sorry. Okay. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, how does that look at different points on the income distribution? 
And what that means is you say, let's take every household in a country like Ireland and you line them up by how much money they have to spend each month from lowest to highest. Now, can I the, just stop you there, John? Just, so, so how do you how do you get that data? Where's the data coming? Is it a survey? How much income you have? You know, where's the original data? Because when you start going deep into data, and I'm going back into my old days as a as a sort of a, an economist working in banks and institutes and things. And the data was in so. Where do you get the data? Where's the where's the where are the numbers coming from? Yeah, fantastic question. I guess you know, anytime you consume, something, you want to know where it's from. So, yeah, in this in this instance, it's it's combining a couple of data sets. We've got. Eurostat, the European Statistics Office, which publishes this for European countries, including up until recently the UK. Um, and that is all, com- all coming from surveys that are carried out in each country. And then in the US, um, that's coming from the OECD, another of these big international organizations that tracks all sorts of economic metrics around the world. So these, it's a survey that is filled in by an individual res- respondent from each household. They tell you how much money they have. Uh, before taxes, after taxes, after social security, that kind of thing. Great. Okay. So, so, it's, so, it's, so it's it's evidence from the ground, and it's so exactly. It's, so yeah. what it's not doing, and this is again to, to to it's not taking a GDP figure and dividing it by the number of people at work or the number of people. So it's actually much more bottom up than top down. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you know these statistics are really important to use wherever we have them, wherever we know that this is the data that corresponds to a real individual or household's lived experience rather than just saying let's take everything in the country and divide it by the number of people i think these, these are where we can really shed light so yeah it's much more revelatory and it's much more accurate exactly yeah exactly so we so we take that and we say okay i'll take all the households and let's line them up from those with the the least money to spend at each month most and we're adjusting for things here like household size as well so it's not as though the people at the bottom end is your single adult household at the top end it's a a young professional class of four bankers, we're making sure that, that we're comparing like to like all the way up. And so then we're saying, well, the median, the, the sort of typical household experience in any given country is if you've got half the households have less money and half the households have more. And so we compare that median household across countries, for example. But we can also say, what about if we take the top 10% or the bottom 10% of households and how are they doing? So in this way, we're not just taking a single number per country, but we're saying if those households are more strung out, more spread out in some countries than others, then instead of just comparing the average, we're saying are there different rankings for those at the bottom and for those at the top? And tell me, what did you find? So it's, it's really it's a huge. Um, just so I tell the listeners, I mean, I've done this years ago when I was younger. This is a huge amount of work to do. It's in a massive amount of data crunching, number crunching checking, rechecking, making sure all your sources are right. So you have all the data, then you do the good stuff, the interesting stuff, the mining, the stuff that I used to love when I was younger. Tell me now, what what did you find? Yeah, so it's really interesting. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed out the amount of work there as well. Because I think when, when I was uh, well into the, the early hours one night doing this and my other half wasn't too keen, um, I think, you know, <laughs> it sort of shows what you have to do for some of this. But yeah, so what it, what it shows, that the best way to think about this is, because the, the amount of income inequality in, in most countries is roughly similar, the people at the top have roughly three times as much to spend at the end of each month than those at the bottom. So what that means is between countries, you get a very similar picture. So if you take someone in a very wealthy European country like Norway, then the richest 10% of people in Norway, richest 10% of households in Norway, are pretty much the richest top earners out of all countries. You know, if, if you're rich in Norway, you're rich by any Yeah, state. you're you're bloody rich. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. And and then when you move down to the middle, to the, the median, that, that household in the middle of the distribution, they're the richest of the medians as well, the richest of the average. And you go all the way down to the bottom end as well. And if you're a poor household in Norway, you're still better off than poor households anywhere else among developed countries. Okay. And some people will see this and go, well, you know, that's, it's all very well if you're, if you're Norwegian, you know, they've got all that oil wealth, of course they're wealthy. But the, the point is not the amount of wealth, it's that relative standing. So it's very similar if you look at a country like the Netherlands or France or Germany. These are all countries where if you're among the richest in those countries, you're among the richest in the developed world. And if you're among the poorest in those countries, you're among the poorest in the developed world. And so you see this and you think, okay, well, you know, that all seems fairly easy to understand that, you know, we can see why that pattern would hold. But you then get to these Anglosphere exceptions. So taking the UK, for example, 
if you're in the top few percent in the UK by income, you are a very, very well off by any standards. You know, you can walk around London, Dublin, Paris, Milan, New York, and you're going to see a standard of living that you're familiar with, and you're going to be able to afford that standard of living. You won't be thinking that, you know, my country's in trouble. You're doing just fine. But once you go down to the middle, things are a little different in the UK. So the average household in the UK is actually well below the average for these other developed countries. Yeah, no, I found those figures starting. We can talk about them and give them context in a minute, but I, I did find them fascinating. So the average in the UK is well below the average of similar countries that you would expect to be all around the same. That's right. So, yeah. So if, if we're looking at countries like the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, France, so again, we're not talking about your, your Norways here. We're talking about countries that someone in the UK would consider to be our peers, as it were. And the average household in the UK is significantly below those other countries in terms of what the average household has to spend each month. And that's the average. But when we then go down to the, the bottom end, to that, that bottom 10% of households by, by the amount of income they have to spend each month, the picture looks even worse. So the UK at this stage is far below the average experience for, bottom, for, for the poorer households in these other countries. And when you now look at the countries for whom the bottom 10% of households have a similar amount of spending power per month in the UK, it's no longer the likes of Netherlands, Austria, France, Germany. It's now countries like Slovenia and the Czech Republic. So, so transition countries. Exactly. And I should pause here because some people look at this and they say, why are you using Slovenia and Czech Republic? It sounds like you're, you're sort of throwing shade on those countries. You're saying, wow, the UK compares to even the likes of Slovenia and the Czech Republic. But the point here is not to say, God, look at you know Slovenia and Czech Republic and these hell holes and, and we're down there with them. It's just to say that at other points on the income distribution, for example, the middle or the top, British people are, are much better off than those countries. So therefore, if you are the average Brit or certainly a, a higher earning Brit, you would expect that poorer Britons would also be much, much more well off than the poorest in countries like Slovenia and Czech Republic. And yet, here we are in 2021, where the lowest earners in a country like Slovenia earn it's actually fairly clearly more than the lowest earners in the UK. I mean, that is kind of, again, it's extraordinary, it's damning, it's a wake-up call, it's it's a whole other conversation, but the data is, un- I mean, and, and I, I've said before about traveling around the UK and feeling, wow, you know, this is this is not a place I recognize, this is much poorer than I thought. So we take that to the UK and the US, broadly similar. So to be poor in any country is awful, right? Because poverty obliterates the future, it does and all sorts of, sort of things, right? But you're saying to be poor in America and Britain is much worse because your rich compatriots are so much richer than you. Exactly. I think it's it's much worse for two reasons. The first is that your rich compatriots are much richer, and that's especially true in the US, where there's a, a, an enormous gap between the poorest and which is the, the richest in the US earn about six times as much as the poorest. And again, remember, in most developed countries, that's three times. So number one, you're you're just experiencing this, this huge gulf between you and people who may even live just across the highway. But then number two, it's just that objectively, your standards of living are far, far, far below where you would expect for a country with those resources. So you know, one way of looking at this is to say, if America, if the US had the same level of inequality between top and bottom as those Western European countries we talked about earlier, the richest Americans would still be among the very richest people in the world, even if you, you redistributed income a bit more evenly. But the poorest Americans would now be much better off. They would actually be much, much better off than the average for developed countries. So you've just got this enormous gap and you could, you could raise, you could, you could lift those living standards of the poor Americans by distributing things even a little bit more equally. Now, before we talk about the why, or the, or the Irish case, which I found fascinating, I think a lot of our listeners will find fascinating. It'll also, it'll also split listeners, it'll cause all sorts of arguments, it'll cause people to say, that's not true, yada, yada, yada. The why. The UK and the US, broadly speaking, the last 30 or 40 years have followed similar social stroke, political stroke, economic policies. Is it all taxation and welfare driven? Is it all state driven? Is it all choices? Yeah, so there's a few things going on here. Now, one part of it definitely is those those decisions about how to redistribute income from the poorest to the richest. And one way we can look at that is you can take um, a statistic called the Gini coefficient. Now, this is 
a sort of aggregate measure of how unequal incomes are distributed between countries. So a higher number means more inequality. You're getting closer towards the top having everything and yeah. the bottom having nothing. And a lower number means you're closer to everyone having exactly the same amounts. And you can look at that both before the government has intervened and said, you should be taxed this amount and that should be given to these people, and after. And what we see when we do that is that the UK and the US have some of the least redistributive regimes of any country. So the inequality of income in the UK and US before taxes and, and benefits is very similar to what it is afterwards. In other words, that the government is not doing a huge amount in terms of saying, you folks at the top are doing very well, let's share a little bit with those at the bottom. Whereas many other countries do much more of that. So before the government intervenes, the UK and the US are among the more unequal, but there are other countries who start out more unequal than the UK and the US and then end up much more equal, whereas those two wouldn't stay. One of those countries is Ireland, the Irish tax and welfare system. And again, it's, it's something that sometimes we don't appreciate in the cacophony of the political discussion is that the tax and welfare system here works, I would say, amongst the hardest in the OECD to rectify those initial inequalities. That's exactly right. So before those taxes and transfers, Ireland actually ranks 33rd out of 37 OECD countries, so developed countries, for income inequality. In other words, it's one of the least equal before the government has intervened. But after the government decides you should have this, you should have that, Ireland is 13th. 33. So it goes from being one of the very worst to much closer to the top. And in terms of what the government is doing, it's the third most redistributive system in the OECD with only Belgium and Finland above it. So those conscious decisions by the government are a huge, huge part of this. And then there are, you know, there are other factors involved as well. So both the UK and the US also have very steep geographical inequality. In the UK, you've got this hugely London-centric economy and London-centric society, which means those in London are able to get very, very, very wealthy, and those in the poorest parts of the country, and, and to be fair, that includes pockets of poverty in London, do much, much worse. And similarly, in the US, you have these concepts of flyover country. You've got these states, particularly in parts of the Midwest, where there's been sort of consistent economic decline now for decades. And you contrast that with somewhere like San Francisco, where people are earning vast, vast, vast amounts of money. Sure, the tech, the tech bros. Exactly. And, you know, so I've been to San Francisco and I, I consider it one of the most dystopian places I've, I've ever seen in terms of what you're seeing side by side in terms of the, the, the enormous wealth and, and people who are really genuinely struggling to, to survive through every day. And, and so that geographical gradient is, is playing a big part here as well. So let's now go to the question I asked you then. So we're on Twitter. I see the UK data. I see the US data. I see data from Norway. And I'm looking at the FT. I'm saying, listen, lads. I said, we're your fourth largest trading partner. We're your neighbor. Tell us what's going on here. Because sometimes the, 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 the FT do these great surveys and they're fantastic. And they, they give us data from Israel and Hungary and Denmark and Luxembourg. I'm like, what about us? Right. So John then said, okay, David, I will, I will, I will get the Irish data. I've got it. I'll put it up. What did it reveal? Yeah, so the Irish data is, um, like you say, depending on what one's perspective is coming into this, it's either a, a relief or it's, it's a shock. But it, in either sense, it's, it's positive news relative to the UK. So if you're well off in Ireland, if you're among those top 5-10% of households, of what you have to spend each month, you look very similar to your counterparts across the Irish Sea. You know, perhaps, if anything, the Irish are, are slightly, slightly better off at those points on the income distribution. But the point is, if you're wealthy in Ireland, you're wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. But when you get down to the middle or to the bottom, that's when the Irish really fare much, much better than the Brits. So if you go to the very bottom, you say, let's take just the bottom 5% of households in terms of how much you have to, to pay with each month, the Irish are about two thirds better off than the UK after adjusting for household size, after adjusting for how much things cost in the country, Two thirds better off. So, so you're, that's, you're you know, saying that's so the, the poorest Irish, according to the data, are sixty percent better off than the poorest British. Exactly, and you know that means the, the poorest Irish are among the most. You know, I won't say well off. That would, that's the wrong term, but they're among the. If you look at the poorest in all wealthy countries, the poorest Irish have pretty much as good a standard of living as any any of those countries. Even when we're talking about the likes of the Norwegians. 
whereas the British are significantly below that level that you would expect in a developed country. So you've got the Irish doing not just well, but but very well among other countries, and the British doing much, much poorer than you would expect. And what about the middle? What about the median? What about the average, the average family, the average, the average household who's, you know, as you said, the median is that that figure, just so we explain, where 50% of the population are poorer and 50% are richer, right? Like 49 point whatever, right? So it's the actually it's, it's it's not the average, it's the point at which you know, half the population is poorer than you, half the population is richer. Exactly. So if we look at that, then Ireland again comes out pretty much looking like the typical developed Western European country. It's, it's up there with your, your Netherlands, Austria, Germany, France, these, these countries that, you know, none of them we, we would consider to be poor. So the Irish look exactly where you'd expect them to be for a country with the, the general economic class of Ireland, whereas the Brits again come out significantly below that mark several rungs down the ladder at that point. So, so Ireland here is the country that you say, based on its economic size, it's looking, it's doing pretty much as you would expect at all points of the distribution, whereas Britain at the middle and below falls, falls well short. And just before you go, I mean, this is again, it, it's something that I have felt over the last couple of years, not just, not just visiting Britain, but Britain because it's beside us. It's also something a lot of Irish people of various different generations, and also we have a massive, massive housing problem here. So people are saying, hold on a second, I think what this discussion does and where I'm going to take it is it reinforces the urgency of getting the housing situation right. Because in a way, we've done a lot of the other heavy lifting and we've done it and we've done it quite well. But if you can't fix housing, it drags all these good things down because people's sense of their own prosperity is destroyed by the fact that they don't have a place to live or they don't have the type of place to live that they feel they should have or we would expect them to have. Can I just ask you before you go, there's... A figure that's sometimes bandied about, and I'm always trying to get my hand, it's called the AIC, which is a aggregate individual consumption rate over the EU. And this shows, I think it's an OECD figure, and this shows that Ireland is not as well off as these figures suggest. What's the, what's the difference? What's, what's going on here? Yeah, so there's a couple of really interesting nuances here. So one is the the, the point that you've touched on earlier about the difference between something which is measuring an actual household's real experience, survey data, the individual level, and a statistic where you say, add everything up, and divide by the number of people. And that difference is, is what we have here. So the AIC, the AIC figures that you mentioned are where you take all the money that could be, everything that could be considered to be something that individuals consume. So whether it's money that they're spending directly, whether it's a sort of service that they're receiving, maybe when they go to visit the GP, or whether it's the education that they're going to receive. So it takes all of that, adds it up, and divides it by the number of households. So, so that's just one point where because these statistics are arrived at in slightly different ways, if the shape of that income, that distribution is different in some countries to others, that can lead the rankings of the countries to shift purely based on some being skewed more in one way okay. or the other. But then we can go into more detailed um, differences as well. So, so one, as I say, is that the fact that the amount of money a household has to spend, that's, that's not measuring things like um, the, the size and quality of the education system, for example, or, or of healthcare. And one thing that is true of Ireland that is less true of other countries, for example, is you've got a younger population and it's a population that therefore perhaps needs slightly less healthcare and certainly consumes less healthcare. So we, when we look at the value of healthcare consumed by households and individuals in Ireland relative to some of these other European countries, it's, it's a fair chunk lower. So one of the things here may be that even if households themselves are in a pretty good position, they're simply spending less, using less resources in some sure. of these sort of government mediated demands. And the, the other issue is, I've always found, and it was, it was evident in the pandemic, is that we had such massive emigration in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, that we have a very small old population relative to where it should be. Not least because most of them are in the UK. Actually, many, many, you know, there's a million people born in Ireland in the UK, and they all, very many of them are elderly at this stage. So that health spending that should be higher in Ireland is not there because our old population is actually considerably less. So if you look at our population tree, it's really weird because our old population is tiny relative to our young population. And that's a function not just of changing demographics, but actually a bulge of mass migration 
in the 60s and 70s, which is now gone. Uh, the other issue on the AIC figure, because it is important, it's important to tease it out, and lots and lots of listeners will be saying, but hold on a second, David, what about this, John, what about this, is, is, is the sense, of course, that the Irish savings ratio is quite high. Exactly, yeah. So especially during the pandemic, the Irish household was saving significantly more money, significantly higher share of their income than countries elsewhere in Europe. But even if you track that back 10 or 20 years, the Irish have generally been above the average, certainly in terms of how much money is saved. So if you have households whose income is is pretty high, it's, it's you know, plenty for them to be to, to give them a decent standard of living, but they're then saving more of that than other countries, then of course their consumption is going to look lower relative to other countries. So I, th- I think the key thing here is to say, you know, the reality for, for most people is probably somewhere in between these two series. We're not saying, you know, Ireland is some kind of hellhole and, and we're not saying that Ireland is Norway, but, yeah. but they're certainly not far from where you would expect a, an economy of that size, which is in a, a big contrast to countries like the UK. John, fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. We will leave it there. We will discuss it. I'm sure we will have all sorts of shouting and roaring about this because a lot of... A lot of things about uh, economics is, you know, the problem with data is it's inanimate, it's unemotional, and it really doesn't, unfortunately, bias itself to one side or the other in the sense of here is what it is. So I think there's a lot of people listening who at the moment in Ireland will find that they're, particularly because of housing, that they will find these figures don't stack up to their standard of living. And I think we will tease that out. But it does suggest to me that if you make these political choices over a four or five decades, if you have, for example, a Tory party government with a small Blairite exception over 30 or 40 years, you get the economics that your politics suggests you're going to get. And that's the, the economics of inequality in the UK. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the one thing I would, I would add in there as well, you, you, you touch on the point about housing. The, the statistics we're talking about here, these disposable income statistics, this is before um, a household has had to, to pay its mortgage or its rent. So it's absolutely possible that if we if we were to bring in more data, um, which you know I would love to do if I can find it, if we if we brought in more data on housing costs experienced by those households at different points of the income distribution, maybe that that brings Ireland as a whole, whether you're rich or poor, down a peg or so. But the, the point is that it's, it won't really change the shape of that distribution. So it may bring both the Irish and certainly the Brits down relative to other countries where housing may be cheaper. But we're still going to see, um, in general terms, a much steeper gradient of inequality, much worse situation for poorer households in the UK uh, and the US than in Ireland. John, pleasure. And we'd love to have you on more because your stuff is wonderful and it's it's very, and what I will do is I'll put up on Twitter, I'll put up again the Irish data so that we can have a chat on this online as well. So John, listen, lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much for that. Thanks very much. Absolutely fascinating stuff there, Yeah, it's Mark. good stuff, isn't it? Really good, really good. And there's so much, by the way, I just want to apologise for the, the quality of the line wasn't great, but sometimes you're in the lap of the gods with the old interweb and stuff. And John is, in fairness, in fairness, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> exacting on the audio, which is great because this is an audio product. People listen. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, anyway. So come here. I'm let, here. I'm here let, to you. Come let, here let's, now. Come let, here. Let's, let's start with this. One of the points that really jumped out to me there was the way the Irish tax system works seems to level everything out yes. in terms yeah. of, of yeah, yeah, equality yeah. and stuff. So that jumping from a kind of 33 out of 37 to 13 yeah. out of 37 yeah. because of government intervention. So explain, explain that a little it. bit. It's, 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 it is fascinating and it's, it's sometimes lost in a lot of commentary, a lot of opinion, a lot of ideology, right? So the Irish tax system is unbelievably progressive. And progressive tax systems are based on the basic idea that the less you earn, the less you pay. Yeah. And the more you earn, the more you pay. So in terms of income, the Irish tax system is unbelievably progressive so that people who earn a lot of money are taxed very, very heavily. And people who earn very, very little money are not taxed at all in most cases, right? Yeah. So how that then works is that that tax system then goes into the welfare system and then that welfare is redistributed through a variety of various different, from the dole to the health service to all those sort of things, right? Now, 
what is interesting is Ireland starts very unequal. Yeah, right. Yeah, it does. But then once the tax and welfare system combine, Ireland becomes much, much more equal. It's about 13th most equal country in the world, which is pretty good, and we're going in the right direction. Yeah. So we go from 33rd to 13th. And what that is, is that the tax system here is unbelievably progressive. Now, what that flies in the face of is this relentless barrage, largely from the left, saying Ireland is a neoliberal country. Now, neoliberal is this idea that it's liberalism on steroids. So basically what the shorthand is, rich people and people who earn a lot of money are privileged by the tax system. Yeah. They're given, it's, it's all nonsense. It's actually not true. Yes. And this data bears it out. So if you look at this difference between, let's say, Ireland and England, England is a neoliberal country. And it's getting more neoliberal. Well, especially after the last <laughs> yeah, but, but Yeah, exactly. So, mini and, budget, and America mini is a neoliberal budget. country. What that yeah. basically means is that, let's take it basically. Typically what happens in more normal countries is the richest people earn three times more than the poorest people. That should be the rule of thumb. Okay. In okay. Ireland, it's slightly above three times. In England, the UK, it is six times. Wow. So rich okay. people earn six times more than poor people. And what that means is that the gap between rich and poor is phenomenal. So what you see in the case of, let's say, we're doing Ireland versus the UK, we should probably do it versus Norway because that's where we want to be. Mm. So Norway is the most equal country in the world, as John said. The UK is one of the most unequal countries in the world. And Ireland at every level, disposable income in Ireland is higher, whether you're poor or rich than the UK. Yeah. Which is an interesting thing. I'll just Yeah, I was give you, fascinated by that actually. Give, I'll give you a statistic, you know, like the, the poorest people in Ireland, so the people who earn the least in Ireland, that's the 5%. So basically 95% earn more than this 5%. At the mm. very, very bottom, they are 63% richer than the poorest people in the UK. Now, this is something that these numbers evidence something that I remember, I think I might have told you about going to a place called Sketchford. Did I in Birmingham? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went there with the football team years ago. And, and I was really, really shocked because I hadn't been outside London for a long time. Yeah. And when I'd been outside London, I'd been in Liverpool to watch a game. I'd been in Manchester. I'd, you know, I'd been to sort of vibrant parts. There was an event on, so you didn't yeah, really take yeah. in. But this is when I was just like Saturday morning. I, I have to say, I because I, I spent six, seven months up in Shropshire doing an it's album. Rural England, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, rural England, which is a which is a very different case altogether. Yeah. Shropshire was quite quite a wealthy part, actually. Yeah, of the, Tory, Tory England up absolutely, there. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. But still, there was still severe poverty there as well. Yeah, no, it's and so 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 these these figures bear that out. And 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 what they do, what they say to you, you know, is you know, there's a, there's a whole brigade, like mm. the, what I call the Ireland is shite brigade, right? Yeah. <laughs> the figures don't bear this out. In fact, uh, standard of living is very, very high here. And the, as you said, the, the tax system is, is doing a lot of heavy lifting to mm. try and bring equality into the system. So what I'm saying is that over the last 40 years, policy in Ireland, whether it's been from left-wing governments or right-wing governments or centre-left or centre-right or centrist has been gradually doing quite a good job at trying to make sure the society holds together. Yeah. Right? That's total contrast with the UK. Now, there is another figure out there, and you were talking about called AIC. AIC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've never heard this term before. So, okay. So, this, this is, okay. so this is when you, when, you, when you study economics, when you go back to, to looking at various different statistics. So disposable income in general what you do is you have survey data. So you have thousands and thousands of people respond to surveys every month based yeah. on how much money they have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they are much more accurate usually than aggregate data. Right. Okay. So basically, it's how are you doing? Right. And the people respond and then you aggregate grand that thanks. up. Right. Okay. Grand <laughs> thanks. Right. And then you identify, okay, these are the poorest people. These are the richest people. These are right. Okay. That's how you do it. Right. That. There's another way of doing it, which is basically you take the aggregate. So AIC is a thing called aggregated individual consumption. Right. right? Okay. And it's basically how much the average person consumes. And that's also a very, very good proxy of how well off you are. Because if you consume more, you're largely better off. Mm. And what it does is it takes public consumption, which is the consumption of, say, healthcare or oh. education, right? Okay. Provided okay. by the state. Yeah. And private consumption, you going out... To the going shops. To the, to the pub, yeah. To okay. the shop, right. right, okay, right or right. buying buying whatever, you know, like, yeah. and aggregates them all up together. And on that level, it's a bizarre thing. Ireland, which does incredibly well on the disposable income stuff, yeah. which we talk, 
doesn't do so well on this aggregate consumption. So people say, well, hold on a second, which one should you use, right? Because there's quite a big, there's a bigger difference in Ireland between disposable income and AIC than in almost any other country. So you think, why might that be? Yeah. And which is most accurate? Yeah. Now, my own thing is always, I always, you know, I was like a truce, John, right? <laughs> so I think just fuse the two together. What I, I, was, I don't understand what you mean. So, so basically, so you've got AIC, right? Yeah. So what they do is they add up all the consumption yeah. of the country. Yeah. And they divide it by the population to get consumption per capita. Right. The problem with aggregate consumption, aggregate anything, is the following. Imagine you and I are going for a drink in a bar, right? Yeah. Let's say there's four of us, right? And let's say we were having a drink, um, the average income, say it's 45 grand, is the average income of the table, right? Right. And so that's 45, that makes sense, right? And we're joined by Dennis O'Brien, God forbid, right? Yeah. <laughs> who has who has a wealth or income of- Yeah, get the wallet out there, Benny. Of 2.3 billion. <laughs> now, what would that mean is the aggregate income of the table would go up to 680 million each. Yes. Right? So you yeah. see how aggregates really can- Our debts would also go up too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, but all that's very true, exactly. And, and, and the litigation <laughs> would go up a little bit. But you see how aggregate, so this is how you lie with statistics, right? Yeah, yeah, Okay, yeah, you yeah. can use all these statistics. So people who haven't studied statistics, say, oh, gotcha. that, that makes sense, right? So AIC is aggregate, okay? That's the first thing. So it's always a little bit, I think, dodgy. Second thing is, because Ireland has got a very, very young population, we consume much less health products the normal populations, because you get sicker as you get older. So okay. when the population is very young, you've got a very low spending on health per head, mm. right? The other thing is that when the population gets very old, you have a much higher spending. So if your ratio of old people to young people is biased towards old people, you spend a lot more. Now, the bizarre thing about Ireland is the following. Because we had so much emigration in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, our old population relative to our young population is very, very small. So we consume even right. less okay. health. So yeah. on the one hand, we consume less health because we're younger. On the other hand, we consume less health because we are much less older. Yes. Right? Yeah. So that's why AIC, I think, is different. And also the fact that AIC doesn't take into account savings ratios. And the bizarre thing, Irish people save a lot. Well, this was the other point yeah. that, that John was saying there, was that our savings... We save 19% of our income. And the European average is 14%. So 5% of GDP is not captured by AIC. So yeah. I would say that this other measure is interesting, but the disparity can be explained quite dramatically. Yeah. But if you're really, really getting up on this, okay, and you say, Ireland is shit, and this is the figure, la, la, la. The best thing is have a truce. Just blend the two statistics together yeah. and clean up with, an, with another blended statistics and you'll see it. But the point is that after 40 years of reasonably good policy on income and taxation yeah. and welfare, and we have a generous welfare state, and we have a tax system that penalizes or at least taxes the people who earn most, we've ended up with a reasonably good mix. Yeah. Broadly North European. In contrast, we have the outlier, the UK. And this week, the last couple of days, John, they've gone even more, as Bertie would say, outlierish, right? <laughs> So yes. their new yes, chancellor, they have. They, I said, when we said on this, this podcast, the UK was like a rogue state. Yeah. That basically what you have, they have now probably the most delinquent fiscal and monetary mix of any developed country. And what you're seeing is trust comes in with the new chancellor. Yeah. They have introduced an extraordinary tax regime which completely benefits rich people. But I, I, I don't understand where, where this is going. This is going it's, back to the, the classic trickle-down economics. Yeah, so this comes back to their madness and pregnancy. But but the, the other thing I heard recently in the... Or did I read it? I can't remember. But before they brought out this mini-budget, there was something like at least half of the UK population were willing to pay a bit more tax. Yeah. And almost half of Tories were willing to pay more tax. This is a... This is a fantastic thing. So they're not listening to anybody. This is an amazing thing, you see. Basically what has happened is as less and less people get involved in politics, those who get involved in politics are much more radical than the average. Because yeah. they're really committed ideologues. So you think the average UK person says, look, the NHS is underfunded, the health system is underfunded, the education system is underfunded, we need to build more bridges, we need to build more roads, need more social infrastructure. Yeah. Most English people feel this. They say, tax us a little bit more, we're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. But as you said, the people in power are much more radical than the average. Yeah. So what you have is a Brexit budget, right? So part of the Brexit 
thing was these very, very right-wing ideologues trying to create this, what they call Singapore on the Thames. Remember that idea? Yes. That we have a low tax, low regulation. So for the majority of Brexit voters, I think it was more nationalism, nostalgia, all that stuff. But there was a sort of a jihadi sect within the Tory party, led by the ERG, Mm. and frankly, rich people in the Tory party saying, this will be great, we can cut taxes and we can get rich. This is exactly what they've done. Now, I'm going to call what's going to happen in the UK the 10 10 5 2020. Okay, go on and explain that right. one. This is, this, is, this is right. So, this was a 10 10 5 2020. This is what's going to happen in the UK. The UK, this time next year, maybe in six months, will have a 10% budget deficit in okay. terms of GDP. Right. They will have a 10% current account deficit. They will have 5% base rates. They will have a 20% fall in their currency and a 20% fall in house prices. Right? That's yeah. what's going to happen. So, so, so what's the outcome so, of so that? The outcome is, so, so basically what you have is because it's a Brexit budget, the, the key problem with Brexit was there were people who lived in a little country thinking they still lived in a big country. Right? So when you have small country ambitions, a country like Ireland, you realize that your latitude for policy is basically hemmed in by the rest of the world. Mm. You can't go out on your own. Right? So you figure out. So when you're a big country like the United States, for example, you can do whatever you want. Why? Because the dollar is the currency of the world. Yeah. So the demand for dollars, for commodities, everything, every trade is settled in dollars. Every big trade, every commodity, there's a huge external demand for dollars, which means the Americans can actually do whatever they want on interest rates, exchange rates, et cetera. Yeah. And their budget deficit. Because the demand for dollars is it's the global reserve currency. So there's a huge non-American demand for dollars. Sure, sure, sure. The UK is not like that. There is no demand for sterling. Nobody wants it apart from UK people who are trading with the UK. So when you decide that you're going to cut taxes for the very rich, Mm. you're going to borrow 45 billion this year, you're going to push your budget deficit up to 10% of GDP, what you have to do is you've got to finance that. You've got to, who's going to buy those gilts to finance it? The UK sell their gilts abroad. Right? So what happens is people think, okay, hold on a second. They now want us to buy their gilts. Well, we're only going to buy their gilts if we think we're getting a bargain. How do we know we're getting a bargain in UK gilts vis-a-vis everyone else? If their currency is very weak, so their gilts are cheap. So the currency has to weaken yeah. in order for them to sell their gilts, right? On the other hand, they have to raise interest rates because you have to reward people. So you have this double whammy. When you're a small country, and you're looking to borrow money. It's like anybody. If you're, right. if you're a small punter looking to borrow money, right? Your so, interest rates are going so, to go so, up. So, hang on a second. So, so they want the value of sterling to, to drop considerably. They, they wanted to play this game that they thought the value of sterling could be maintained. But the market said, well, hold on a second. Right. You're, you're a small Mickey Mouse country. Like you're a big country, but in the overall scheme of things, right? So the Europeans, for example, have the, the Eurozone. Mm. What that means is that the eurozone largely trades with itself. So when the euro goes up and down in value against the dollar, it doesn't make a material increase in inflation, yeah. right? Britain is a very open economy and quite small. So when sterling goes up or down, the inflation rate changes. So when sterling falls, all imported prices go up straight away in the yeah. United Kingdom. That then means that the forward inflation rate, the one that you expect to happen in a year or two, goes up. And if that's going up, then your interest rates have to go up to cover that. So you have this, it's a very simple, it's a trilemma, what we call in macroeconomics, that right. you can control your rate of interest, your currency rate, or your current account. You can control two of them, but not three, right? right? So something has to give. So what's happening now is sterling is giving and the gilt market is giving. We said a couple of months ago, Britain was going to have a bond crisis. It's having it now. Yeah. And the yeah. reason it's yeah. having it now is these inconsistent problems with all these various, various, what they call... In the literature, these structural problems deep in the UK economy, right? And what you have is they're run by people who believe they're running a big economy when in actual fact they're running a small economy, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is the UK has had very low interest rates for a long, long time. Huge amount of the British population has remortgaged, has extended themselves leverage-wise at interest rates between 0 and 1%. Mm. The base rate will be 5%. Before we know it, there could even be an emergency Bank of England meeting this week if sterling continues okay. to fall. Right. Base rates going from one to five means a huge swathe of the UK housing market goes bust because people can't pay that sort of debt at a time 
when inflation's going through the roof, when real incomes are falling. So that's why so I said... So the property, property market is going to collapse? Uh, well, it's, I'd say it'll be down 20% by the end of the year. Whoa. Not at the end of the year, the, the end of 12 months, right? Yes, yeah, because yeah, Because yeah. of, the, because of wow. the rate of interest, okay. right? The rate okay. of interest. Right? Now, then you've got to think, okay, but well, what about all the money that's going on the tax cuts? So somebody's making money from the tax cuts. And a statistic came out this morning which shows that, and it's, it's an amazing statistic, 50% of all the tax cuts will go to the top 5% of earners in the UK. <laughs> Going back to our discussion with John, yeah, the last thing the UK needs is a budget like this because it amplifies and exacerbates the existing social inequalities that are built into the system, starting from your trickle-down idea. Because yeah, the yeah. trickle-down idea is basically the rich people will get rich, they'll spend loads and loads of money, and the crumbs off the table will fall to the yes, poor. Yeah. That's basically it, yeah. right? So what they've done is they've baked in another decade of inequality. They've baked in, like, if you think about what the UK were doing during austerity, right? When interest rates were very low, the UK went for austerity, so they were cutting back borrowing. And that, of course, austerity, as I always say, always affects poor people more because poor people depend on the state more. Mm, mm. Now interest rates are rising. Not only are they not cutting back borrowing, they're expanding borrowing, but all the money's going to rich people. I mean, it makes no sense unless you believe Go on. Ideologically, in trickle-down economics. Unless you believe ideologically in the Brexit jihadi view that you will turn the UK into this low-tax, low-regulation. So basically what yeah. you do... But why would you believe in trickle-down economics? Because well, it has never worked anywhere at any time. Unless you're rich. Unless you okay. talk to rich people, right? Unless you're ideologically driven. But what I think is going to happen in the UK is the budget deficit and the current account deficit. The UK started with an 8% current account deficit. We've had a current account surplus for about 20 years, right? We've had a budget surplus. We've got a budget surplus tomorrow. Yeah. Going into a budget with a surplus, right? Managed reasonably well, okay? There's lots of problems in Ireland, but they're not on this level. You start with a current account deficit, which means you start, John, needing to borrow money just to maintain your standard of living, which is being rented, not earned, right? Yeah. You superimpose upon that a budget deficit, which means we're going to spend even more money that we don't have and we're going to borrow, right? So you're putting borrowing on borrowing. That pushes up your rate of interest because the risk premium associated with the UK goes through the roof. And then as the risk premium goes through the roof, what happens is your currency has been falling anyway, right? It means your inflation rate gets worse. Yeah. And all the while, things like your property market, which are based on low interest rates, have to recalibrate for much, mm. much higher interest rates. So, I mean, it's it's a it's an unbelievably delinquent, it's like an emerging market. Do you remember two years ago, two and a half years ago, when yeah. Boris Johnson got in and I said the UK could turn into Argentina? Yes. And it sounded yeah. mad. It's happening. This is what's happening. The UK is turning into an emerging market. So the country that had the premier position in the world financially just after the Second World War, yeah. maybe before the Second World War, right, with sterling being the preeminent currency, is now looking and behaving like an emerging market. And an emerging market is a country that needs to borrow from the rest of the world all the time simply to maintain a semblance. So when all the pomp of Queen Elizabeth's, the kind of sugar rush they had, the collective sugar yes, rush yeah. of the last 10 days, 12 days or whatever it was, right, now that's all laid bare. And what you have is a very radical, as you said, top of a party, not reflecting the average English person, who's like, you know, we need to invest. It's fine. We don't need tax breaks. Nobody wants tax breaks in the yeah. UK. Giving money to the richest people to amplify inequality and in so doing to make the country less stable. It's bizarre. At a time when constitutionally, Northern Ireland is changing. We see more Catholics than Protestants. Scotland is changing. At the time, the, the forces that hold the country together are atrophying. And then you superimpose this on top. I mean, it's, it's bizarre stuff, John. Okay, so we have a budget this week. Yeah. What should we be doing then? Well, I mean, our budgets are framed with stability in mind. I think we'll give a big, big subsidy for electricity prices because people need it, because yeah. electricity prices yeah. are going through the roof. But in general... What it shows you is a country that has figured out its long-term plan and where it's going. And so the budget isn't such a big deal. It's just an iteration every single year. The UK 
is a country that's making it up on the hoof. And you can see the profound difference. All we've got to do here, we come back to it again, 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 fix housing, build houses, build council houses, build rich houses, build poor houses, build houses for everybody. And all the other heavy lifting is done. So we can see where we're going. All you can see over there is fog on the channel. Now, remember, the 3rd to the 6th of November, Kilkenomics in Kilkenny, the world's only economics and stand-up comedy festival. And John, tickets have been absolutely flying. That's brilliant. Yeah. No, That's I mean, fantastic. It, so it means people really want to come back out. All the stuff you hear in the podcast, all the voices, all your old favourites. We have many, many of our podcast legends coming in from all over the world to join us. Have a look at the lineup, kilkenomics.com. Get your tickets and we'll see you in Kilkenny.